Um, I'm Lisa Elliott. I'm in Seattle. And I know Rabea from my Vegas study group, which is on Facebook, and you are all invited to join. It's a private group. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about me to, to sort of set the stage for what I want to talk about. Um, like so many people, um, I have a, a history of childhood trauma and um, went through life trying to meet life in the best way that I could with all of these messages in, in, <clears throat> imprinted on my body and on my psyche that guided my access to um, activities, to relationships. And <clears throat> eventually, I became an aerial acrobat and later in life and got quite good at it and became a coach and a performer and <clears throat> learned at that time that there are an enormous number of people who are in chronic sympathetic arousal in the circus arts. And as a coach, I became more and more holistic in looking at how um, <clears throat> the way people inhabit their bodies affects their access to power creativity, um, uh, movement without injury, um, certainly self-awareness. So this, this was very formative for me in understanding our embodiment. That was my entry point in working with people and trying to help them to <clears throat> move towards their movement goals in terms of, in particular, in terms of movement technique in aerial acrobatics. Um, <clears throat> And I have had a chronic illness, probably multiple labeled chronic illnesses for most of my life. So I was constantly training and working at this edge in terms of my illness. Interestingly, too, I'm mostly self-taught. And partly that's because as a person with a trauma history and a lot of illness, <clears throat> it was vitally important. I created this container of my movement practice to where it was vitally important that I have a, a very clear, um, Jill just came into the room and um, I don't know if it's for the rest of you, but um, I'm not on the screen anymore. Perhaps I am on yours, but perhaps Jill could uh, turn off their video. Um, so, it was it created this container and this pressure to fine tune my ability to read what what I was experiencing in my body. Um, oh, okay, I hear you can see me. I just can't see you. Um, so eventually, my chronic illness really caught up with me, and I experienced something called an aortic dissection, and my my aorta tore very catastrophically, and and I, I came very close to dying. And <clears throat> that marked an end to my aerial acrobatics work and the beginning of asking the question, where can I go from here? You know, recognizing all that my body was requiring and, and wanting to continue to um, live fully into my life through a very, very long process of recovery and then, you know, decline in health combined with the chronic illness. So it's such an amazing school of <clears throat> embodiment, really. And I think uh, if, if I communicate anything today to you, it would be that I have come to believe through my understanding of polyvagal theory, through my own explorations as an athlete and as someone with severe injury and illness, um, that it is a beautiful and perhaps imperative thing that we meet the body where it is at, that we have been enculturated to essentially bully the body, to show up to, for someone, for example, who is in a state of shutdown and disembodiment, to follow the, the societal should, to go to yoga, to try and relax, or, um, you know, depending, there are lots of different autonomic states and there are mixed states, which is super important to understand. Um, 
that when we when we don't compassionately meet our body where it's at there is always a form of oppression happening this is in a very delicate dance with creating an invitation to shift state and <clears throat> i've written an essay called the threshold sheer theory of embodiment and it's on my website and i think you have that but it's at um, it's at selacounseling.cloud, and it's also on the study group, the Vegas study group, um, where state shift is is state shift challenges our idea of causality because we don't push a button on the vagus nerve to stimulate the vagus nerve and expect a state shift. Polyvagal theory gives us a scientific map, proposes a scientific map because it's a theory. And then the, the validation of it happens when in it is used as a framework in scientific experiments. It, it shows us how everything is connected. It's a beautiful framework for showing us how the human body is a, a creature of connection. We are a creature of connection to our environment. And, and that is multi-generational. It's during gestation when we are forming inside of the womb of our mother. And uh, I believe the, the, the influences during that time are one of the, the you know, it's the, the part of the iceberg that's under the water, I think is our pre-birth experiences. And I think, um, you know, now I didn't tell you, now I'm a, um, in internship. I'm finishing graduate school to become a counselor. It's a wonderful career change and I'm working with uh, Sharon Stanley as my internship supervisor and um, she is my I am the luckiest woman in the world to be working with Sharon and her somatic transformation method which um, is kind of in the same world as somatic experiencing so um, I can't remember how I got on that but we are creatures that have been created across time by our environment and this is a key point I'd like to make about polyvagal theory that shows how our nervous system responds to cues of safety and threat within the context of a body that has evolved in a certain pattern to respond appropriately to our environment. For example, I'll give you an amazing little scientific tidbit that I think illustrates this. Um, <clears throat> there's research on mice that shows that when a male ejaculates, the sperm travel through the epididymis before exiting his body. When the sperm go enter the epididymis, the epigenetic markers that determine many traits, especially related to stress, our stress response, are intact. They are stripped off in the middle of this journey through the epididymis, and then they are placed back on before the sperm exits the body. And in that journey, the, the sperm gets an update to the father's um, environment that gets passed on to the body. So it's a positive thing. It's, a, it's the brilliance of adaptation to prepare us for the environment that we are going to be born in. And same with the, the influences um, of, of um, our gestational period, that these things, the, the, the experience of the mother's stress is crucial information that will prepare our little bodies to best cope with the environment that we are born into. So the, this kind of information, and I, I, I think um, there was an anticipation that I would teach you polyvagal theory, and I, I feel like that would be a waste of my time today. You, I can teach you that in the Vegas study group. I can send you other information that can support this. But just know that <clears throat> polyvagal theory has provided an amazing map for how human bodies are connected to our environment in the current moment, in the past, um, and, and how it's all adaptation. And when we, when we ignore the state of the body and decide with our minds the state we want the body to be in, I think we are bullying the body. And <clears throat> in our movement, and, and I will, um, state that as a as a movement teacher, my movement teaching evolved into um, floor flow and you know kind of this embodiment group counseling thing. 
it's very hard to do really well in a group, especially if your, your group is all the people who gave up on movement classes because so many people <clears throat> who are taught that they should bully their nervous systems show up at movement classes and feel like a failure. I can't sit still. I can't breathe without freaking out. Um, and, and I think for very many people, especially um, anyone who isn't in a highly privileged class, being told what to feel or, or what state the body should be in can be very triggering. And um, I'm kind of, I'm wandering all over the place, but I, I feel very passionately that it's important to understand the role of social justice and oppression in our embodiment. And this is, if I have a passion in life, it's to show how, for example, polyvagal theory, which is a, a language that allows different worlds to communicate. The world of biodynamic craniosacral therapy and yoga can communicate to the scientific and medical communities through this language of polyvagal theory. So it creates a bridge. Um, but there are many, many different ways of knowing. And um, this ways of knowing, another word for that is epistemologies. So I love studying epistemologies and how they influence what we have access to in our knowing and in our experience and what, what they deny us access to. And I would say that uh, the, the scientific method, which is so highly privileged in our societies, um, has blinded us to our embodied knowing and polyvagal theory, though it doesn't mean to in many ways, um, uh, gives us an opportunity to, to make those connections. So I wanted to follow up a little bit more on that example of meeting the body where it is at. It's very hard to do in a group class setting because everybody's experience is so different. Uh, and when I have taught what I call embodied flow, um, we start with just creating a safe container. It's a beautiful, quiet, private room. I am, in my embodiment, I am the best um, anchor that I can be for a regulated nervous system. And for many people who have experienced trauma, and that's a vast majority of those who are suffering with pain and chronic illness, they may have not experienced something they would label as traumatic in their lifetime, but it could have been in their gestational experience or in the epigenetics of their ancestors. And those are imprinted in the physiology. And they are a response to what are completely normalized stressors. For example, I can see on the screen that, that many of you are in city environments and this is an environment which can create a subtle and, and chronic threat response in the, in, the, in the body. And it's so normal we don't <coughs> even think about it. Um, systems of oppression, um, the patriarchy, which is not about men, but it's about the water that we all swim in, at least in the Western, Western European and North American and South American uh, continents. Um, these communicate often to those who are not white men, a, a chronic threat response. And it's that setting in which we are offering these, this wonderful feast of movement interventions. But ideally, we would first attune to, with great respect and compassion, where the body is at and meet it there. So, so this approach can offer those who have had a very um, contentious relationship with their body, kind of a hateful relationship for the body that, is, that they perceive as broken, for the body they perceive as being in some sort of war with them, um, the body that has failed. This understanding of the way, not just our nervous system, but all systems are adapting to the environment we live in, we can then begin to see how brilliant our bodies are and how hard they're trying to deal with all of these stressors. 
thank you, thank you, body, for all you have done to try and keep me self safe in a very difficult world across many generations. So in working with clients, it's as a teacher, I am, I am, I bear a great responsibility to provide a neuroceptive environment, which is inviting, accepting, honest, and deeply respectful of my students or my clients' state. And it's a very tricky thing to have a, a group class curriculum that involves movement that can then meet everyone where they're at. So um, I've been talking for about 15 minutes and I, I really could talk about this for hours, but I would like to connect it to some movement practices and I'll, I'll sprinkle it in with more thoughts about the nervous system in particular. The nervous system and in particular the vagus nerve is in, in some ways a beautiful and, and really poetic um, um, model or symbol of the connectedness of all systems. And uh, if you don't know the term and the idea of reductionism, it's a good one to become familiar with because there's value in reductionism to organize our thinking, to give us some models to say, oh, it's all about the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is one lens and one way into um, understanding our experience and also into providing therapeutic experiences that, that are intended to give us greater access to all the potential of our, our lives and our, our unique being. So, um, but it's really not about the vagus nerve. And if you'll check out my threshold essay, I'll talk about how we can create the conditions. We can use our minds and our resources in classes to create the conditions for change to occur, for the change that of life just becoming itself, of life just moving through us and blossoming us like a flower to move through us and um, without being reductionist. There's value in zeroing in on this idea of polyvagal theory and the autonomic nervous system, and then zooming back out to poetry, where we can live into our own experience of that. So what I would start with, I'm gonna stand up in a minute, but so I can stay closer to you in this screen, I would start with just orienting. And I would do this briefly at the beginning and ending of any kind of session so that people are invited to meet their bodies where it is at, whatever that is. Let's see, can you let us know where to find the threshold essay, please? Um, it's, on, it's both in the Vegas study group and on my website, which is selacounseling.cloud, and we will provide those um, references in comments on, the, on Rabea's um, group. So orienting. It's a way of getting in our bodies, a way of getting in the moment. It's a way of recognizing our nervous system state. I'm going to stimulate the nerve endings in my, the palms of my hands. I'm feeling the temperature of my hands. I'm feeling the temperature of the air in the room. I'm using all of my senses to just be here. I'm changing, especially when we're on a screen, for those of you doing a lot of work on a screen, I'm changing my focal distance. So I look close, I look far away, and I look at something in detail. I have plants around me and I can look at a leaf and see the wrinkles and veins and colors and be present with that leaf as much as my body is able to. And thank you body for not being able to notice very much because there's a, there's a protective urge being enacted. Um, quality of light. Um, the feeling of my voice resonating in my body. Sense, sounds. Move through all of your senses. And if you are able, if it is not overwhelming, you can notice um, in whatever detail you have access to, what is your nervous system state? Can you tune in and feel not just the emotion of it? There is often an emotion attached, what we might call anxiety or peace, 
but there is a sensation, uh, an elemental, fundamental sensation in our bodies that cannot help but be true. I would assert that sensation is a guide to what cannot help but be true. The challenge is understanding what it means because it, its meaning can be rooted in a past experience, a past imprint. It can be rooted in something that happened before we were born. It can be rooted in something that is so normalized that we don't even notice it yet anymore. Like the experience of thread in being in a, in a, an electromagnetically charged room with Wi-Fi and cell signals. I'm someone who believes that those um, have an impact on our cellular health. And your body might be telling you that it matters and that it's influenced by it. So it, it gives us an opportunity for curiosity. So checking in with the nervous system, with emotions, with thoughts, I'm here. And then in my movement classes, um, I'm someone who has never done very many movement classes myself because I never had the money for it. I was a single mom and I'm very self-taught and inspired by people like for floor flow. One of my original inspirations was Marlo Fiskin. And I can, I can offer that link when we have the opportunity. Um, there's an organization called J on, on Instagram, they're J Wilton dance. And they're like the, the superheroes of floor flow. And it's kind of a combination of modern dance and Capoeira and Feldenkrais and blah. The reason I want to bring that here today is that um, floor flow gives you a starting place to ask the question of yourself, regardless of your physical state, to say, where can I go from here? <laughs> I got into this after open heart surgery, after a whole bunch of other surgeries, after 11 weeks in the hospital. And I'm continuing to do this as my health actually declines. It's been getting much worse in the past year. And I still want to show up for them the greatest amount of vitality um, and expression of my potential in the world as I can. So I show up for it and I say, where can I go from here? And I will start with um, a little movement sequence and we'll just do this for less than 10 minutes, just as a starting place. And of course, it's not gonna work for everybody. If you have both back pain and knee pain, that's gonna knock a bunch of this out. If you have zero energy, um, we're gonna meet that where it's at. For those people with CFS ME, and I have some very good friends who live with this, that's gonna look very different. <clears throat> and of course, we have this feast of, of movement possibilities and ideas. But I'm going to stand up now and move back. <clears throat> I do this. Uh, I love a big slippery floor in a yoga studio, for example. And I wear socks so that I can really slide on the floor. And I usually wear knee pads, which I'm not wearing right now because I, I want to be kind of as limited as you are. So. Um, I'm going to try and do things that don't take much room, like about a yoga mat's worth of room. So these are knee pads, <clears throat> and I can give you a link to them. They're dance knee pads, and it's hard to know how to adjust the screen. <clears throat> so let's just start with uh, what I call elephant foot. And one of the other teachers, I think it was Rabea, did this too, of feeling into your feet. And if I will share this beautiful video with you of the incredible structure of an elephant's foot that is largely fatty tissue with bones in it. And the, the mind blowing thing about the elephant's foot is they listen to their environment through their feet and they, they are receiving the vibrations from miles away. And if we watch that video and visualize our own feet as the elephant's foot meeting the ground, and perceiving the ground. It's a beautiful image. So starting with elephant foot, shifting your weight to one side and doing what I call kickstand, which is like a bicycle. So your toe is on the ground, shifting to the other side, kickstand. <clears throat> I'm seeing a low battery um, message on my computer and I don't wanna risk losing you. So I have to 
plug it in. <clears throat> no choice here. Okay. So shifting our weight onto one foot, little kickstand, shifting to the other, remembering that elephant foot, mushing into the ground. See if you can balance and lift that foot. Shift again, and you know I'm moving fairly quickly now because I just want to give you ideas. It's not really a full movement practice. Can you lift that foot up? Can you balance? And then I'm standing on my left leg with that elephant foot activated, and I'm gonna take my right toe and inscribe a circle, a half circle starting in front and moving around the side and around and around back and then bringing back to center. Shifting my weight onto my right foot, taking the left toe, inscribing a half circle and coming back to center. And I tend to not cue people about breath. Just keep repeating this because <clears throat> there comes a point where it can be a good idea to me to guide it. But the breath is definitely an expression of state. And I want to meet state where it's at with respect and compassion. And I want to create the conditions for that breath to move differently. If neuroceptively the body senses <clears throat> the right conditions for that. And again, there's this delicate dance between uh, meeting the body where it's at and creating an invitation to shift states. Okay, now we're going to go to something that probably requires good knees, and I would obviously create an, a, an adaptation for those whose knees don't like this. So starting with feet in the middle, I'm going to shift my weight onto my right foot, take the left toe, and we're going to go towards the floor. I'm going to take this around the back, 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 back cross the midline, and then begin to go down. And I'm going to put, rest my weight on my left knee on the floor. And then I'm going to stand up again. And I'll tell you, I'm, I haven't been able to move much for six months because of health stuff. So <clears throat> I'm not doing this as a really, you know, strong, capable mover right now. But I have history. I have body memory. Right foot now is sweeping around the back, going down to that right knee and up. Okay, and I'm just going to show you how we can use this to get to the floor. And then, because we we don't have a ton of time, I want to move to something that's even more gentle than this. So I'm standing on my right foot. My left foot is inscribing that circle, and this time we're going to go down to bottom on the floor. Me first, and then shift your weight so you're balanced, or use your hands. Using hands is always an option. And then I'm sitting on the floor in this sort of pretzel position. I'm not a yogi, I bet it has a yogi name. <clears throat> and that's where I'll stop with that sequence for now, but there's more of this sequence in video online <clears throat> that was created in collaboration with my students so that we could sort of navigate their limitations, their desires, what felt good to them. And it starts from here, and then it goes into this sort of really fun sequence of movements, getting up off the floor. But stay on the floor, <clears throat> and I'm going to shift my camera a little bit so you can see me on the floor. So if you've got a floor space or a yoga mat, go to the floor and I'm just going to show you really where I would say try starting here and say where can I go from here and very interestingly um, <clears throat> I've done this on my own created my own movement sequences and when I look at other people online who are doing similar things we have discovered very much the same vocabulary so the where can I go from here ends up revealing some, some really beautiful common human movement patterns. So from the floor, I'm going to lay on my back, 
knees are bent. Let's see, can y'all see me? Yep, yeah. okay. So this is gonna be a full body thing. So hopefully you have room for your arms. I call this snow angel. One of my favorite things is making names up for things. So I'm gonna start by rolling to my left hip and my hands are coming up overhead like a snow angel to meet over the head. I'm rolling to the left side and my right leg is gonna sweep up and around. I'm pretty flexible so I can bring it far. Doesn't matter how far it goes, it can go to here. And then snow angel arms back around as I roll to my back. My knees are again bent up in the middle. I'm gonna to go to the right side. <clears throat> my left arm is gonna sweep down in front as my left leg sweeps up. So I'm just gonna repeat this. I'm not sure I explained it super well. The arms are moving overhead. There's no wrong way to do this. Just make friends with the floor, rolling side to side. Okay, I'm gonna finish with sitting up. So I can roll to the side and then take this right foot and extend it so that I'm sitting up. And then I can go back down, being guided by my hands, a little bit of weight going on my arms. And I know this is hard to follow right now, just to show you where this can go. And then I can sit up. And this is, that's where I'm gonna end, but this is endless and, and lovely and fun and gentle. And I never bully my body because my body will not have it. And bullying my body is re-traumatizing. I will tell you that. That when, when I even follow this lovely group of instructors, I have enough imprint on my body that that can be dangerous, that my nervous system comes up into that moment with barriers, with alarm, with disembodiment, with shutdown, and, and uh, I would love to talk sometime about how mixed states, shut down and sympathetic arousal can happen at the same time. And it's a very, very common strategy in, play, in, in times and relationships where there is a power differential, where the person respond, is responding to someone who has more power than them. So that's also called fawn or appeasement. Uh, it's a variety of things, but it's a mixed state that is an adaptation to dealing with the moment. So thank you for listening. We've got two minutes for Q and R, Q, <laughs> Q and A. Um, so any any questions? Let's see. <clears throat> Richard says absolutely brilliant, and so agree on the traumas influence. Please provide the reference discussed by. Um, for the floor flow in the Facebook group. Would anyone else like to ask a question? We'll go for one question at live. I think probably we can wrap it up then, Rabea. I do have a, I do have a okay. question. I'm gonna try to, I don't want to be rude. I'm gonna try to get rid of my mute. All right, so, all right, thank you again. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Um, when you say you go from one position to the others, there's no right way to do it. I, I get that in the hand motions and so forth, but when you move with the, um, you know, the pelvis, the, the lower back, the legs, is, is, isn't is there any danger of injuries or, or anything? Yeah, absolutely. No. That's why this is so hard to teach to a group. All oh, right, 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 okay. Um, and uh, I have, in my last very close group, it's like group counseling movement, um, we had an incredible variety of injuries and abilities and ages. And we were able to adapt that basic flow to recent knee surgery, um, serious back pain, and it took time. It takes time and it takes, you know, creating the conditions so that people can show up to that space and not feel like they're broken, doing it wrong. 
when they meet their body, I hear you, you know, that, that compassionately listening to those limits. Um, and keep in mind, you know, as movers or, or students or teachers, it's so hard to know. You know, I could think, okay, my back is not giving me any warning signs. I think I'm going to be okay. And then the next morning you wake up and it's like, oh, I was wrong. Yeah. You know? So we will, we will not do it perfectly. I learned that certainly through 10 years of aerial acrobatics. Wow. Very <laughs> fragile. Very fragile. Thank you. Richard. Thank you.